Hello and welcome to Module 1, Section C, all about your decluttering toolbox. When decluttering, there are so many different perspectives, and we might find that different perspectives work better for others. I want to share the 10 top decluttering methods or strategies that you might be able to find helpful in your journey. These are proven strategies. Many of these you probably have heard of before, but I want to put them all in one place for you so it's easy to decide what makes the most sense. Sometimes we might know what the methods are, but not necessarily have a systematic way about going about them or trying them out. But specifically with the materials today, my hope is that you figure out which couple strategies you prefer using and start using those. But then when you do encounter roadblocks in the future, you shift to one of the other strategies to continue problem solving and becoming successful. There's a saying that you might have heard before that says, if plan A doesn't work, there are 25 other letters in the alphabet. Similar to this idea, if one of these methods doesn't work for you, I'd love for you to try out the other methods to continue working through your clutter with a slightly different perspective or in a new way. So I hope you'll enjoy these strategies. Let's get started. Let's get started with section C. This section is all about your decluttering toolbox and I'll be sharing 10 common strategies that you can use to help you be successful with your decluttering. And we'll talk about what each of these strategies are, as well as the types of clutter it works best for. This is a quick overview of what the 10 strategies are. Of course, some of these might have slightly different names in other places, but the concepts might be the same. These are 10 different strategies I think you'll find to be really helpful. They are in no particular order, but let's get started. First up, the pack it away approach. This is great if you have items you are unsure about, and you can pack them away for a certain period of time, such as 30 days. If you want the time period to be shorter or longer than 30 days, that's great too. This is especially helpful for those maybes. Perhaps you're sorting out your items and you think you probably can let them go, but you're just quite not sure if you're ready to do it. Putting them aside and seeing if you need them or remember them during that time period can give you some clarity. After the 30 days are up, or whatever your time period, see if you actually needed those items or if you missed them. If not, consider letting them go. And this method does work best when you have items that you think you should be able to declutter but aren't quite sure yet if it's the right choice. Another method that's really great is the put it to the test method. This is one of my personal favorites. If it's been a while since you have used a certain item or let's say worn a piece of clothing, or if you have something that was expensive but haven't used it, maybe you've got some financial guilt, try it out, actually put it to the test. When you try on that piece of clothing or try out using that gadget, that kitchen gadget, for instance, you actually get a lot of clarity. Number one, you could find out that it's really awesome and why haven't you been using it? Maybe you'll be able to start incorporating it into your regular daily life. However, you also might find that it's not what you hoped for and that there's not as much value as you thought. You might also find when it comes down to it, you really don't actually want to have to put it to the test. Maybe you have resistance to actually using it or wearing it or whatever the case is. That also gives you a lot of clarity because if you aren't willing to use it, then there's certainly no reason to hold on to it. And I think this method does work best for any items you use physically. The favorites only approach is great, especially for things like duplicate items. If you have larger quantities of certain items, keep only your favorites and declutter the rest. The saying goes, keep the best, declutter the rest. You can decide how many of your favorites you wish to keep of any type of item. Keeping only your favorites means that all of the items will be your favorites, which is a really exciting mindset shift to make and to think that you don't own anything that's not a favorite of yours, at least when you've got these volumes of different items. This method works best for things like clothing and accessories, personal care products, decorations, books, hobby items, among others. Anything that you've got a larger collection of, just focus on keeping your favorites. Another great method is frequency of use. You can use this method to see if your use of an item 
justifies you keeping it. There are a variety of different number metrics people can use with this. I've heard people talk about a 90 day rule before. This method here gives a little bit more flexibility. In this method, with each item, ask yourself if you have used it in the past year or if you plan to use it the next year. And you want to be very honest with yourself about this. So did you use it in the last 365 days or do you plan on using it in the next 365 days? And I like the year long approach because it accounts for anything that's seasonal. A lot of our items are seasonal, whether it's as obvious as seasonal decor or holiday items, or maybe it's you live in a climate where you've got set wardrobes or even things like bedding that pertain to a certain season. This gives you a lot more flexibility, but also still important for you to honestly think about your items and whether you have used them or will use them again. If your answer is yes to at least one of these questions, keep it. And if the answer is no to both questions, let go of the item. And this works best for any household items and anything that can be used or put to the test, essentially. Next up is memory alternatives. This method works great for sentimental items that you don't really need, but you use them as a memory tool. In this case, you can consider changing how you use an item or how you remember it. There are a variety of ways you can do this. Rather than keeping the physical item, consider documenting it with a photo or a memory scrapbook. If it's paper copies, maybe scan a copy of the file and store it digitally. Maybe create a decluttering journal where you document these different files and items, or even create a new memory about the item and what it represents. We are going to go over more specific versions of this as we get into sentimental clutter and how we remember those items, but these can be meaningful ways that we can still maintain our memories and cherish our memories, but also be able to let go. So this method does work best with sentimental items or anything that has that emotional connection. Next up, we have multiple uses. If you have many single use items, see if you can replace them with a multi-use item. Single use items really do come in all forms, but the idea here is to see that if you didn't have that item, what would you use instead? Would this alternative be as just as good of a use as the single use item? It's likely that many of our products are you know, specialized to just one thing, but that we could find an alternative use for it that would double up and then give you the option to consider letting go of the specialized item. The key here is to evaluate that it is just as good of a use as the original. If the single use item was something you used regularly and the alternative is not as effective, in that case, you would still want to keep the single use item. But I think this method can work great for a variety of items, such as personal care products. An example with makeup or skincare is if you were able to switch to a moisturizer that not only was a face lotion, but maybe it also was a sunscreen and maybe even a tinted moisturizer, so it meant you weren't using as much foundation or other skincare products. There are also two-in-one shampoos and other body care products that can be used in multiple ways. Maybe those are worthwhile swaps to make. Maybe it's kitchen gadgets. If you've got a really good chef's knife, maybe you're able to declutter your garlic press, your mandolin, and your other choppers that you might have if you weren't using them a lot just to have this one simple, easier to use item. Furniture also could apply as well as really any other items that you use for more than one purpose. Another great approach is to sort things into piles. There is also a lot of flexibility with this method. If you have a lot of clutter or more general items to work through, consider sorting it into a variety of piles. You might choose to use a yes pile, a maybe pile, and a no pile. And you also might choose to have these piles be keep, move, donate, sell, or discard. Really, it depends whatever the needs are for that particular space or type of clutter. Personalize the piles used for the type of clutter you are dealing with. And this method works great for any type of clutter that you have a larger volume of 
and works great when going through drawers, cabinets, or other organizers. Typically, if you're using this method, you'd probably be emptying out the components of one drawer or one bin and going through the items in there one at a time, sorting them into the meaningful piles, and then replacing what you choose to keep and taking action on the other items. So that could definitely work for a lot of different types of clutter. You could also consider numbers-based targets. If you have an area of clutter that you're working on, such as your closet, printed photos, hobby items, books or movies, or anything else with many items, set a number-based goal for what you get rid of. You can think about this in multiple ways. This could be either a number, such as 10 pairs of shoes that you were trying to declutter, or it could be a percentage, such as 10% of your books. The number targets can make things easier for us, especially if we do have a really large percentage. It can help us feel like we're moving forward and also help us make choices. Because if you're deciding, I'm going to get rid of 10 pairs of shoes, that forces you to look at your total amount of shoes that you have and really make some tough choices about which ones are worth keeping and which ones you plan on letting go of. And of course, the numbers can depend upon your own situation. If you only have 10 pairs of shoes, obviously that would be too many to get rid of. And maybe for you, 10% of your books would be too little to get rid of. Maybe you'd want to up that to a higher number. Obviously, it just depends on the person. An alternative to this method could be to incorporate small amounts of decluttering each day and maybe set a goal of getting rid of one item per day or whichever number works for you. This method works best when you have a large number or volume of items that you wish to declutter significantly. The next approach is the next small action approach. If you find yourself getting stuck when decluttering, try breaking your project into small actionable steps. Sometimes we get overwhelmed because we're trying to do too much. We might think, I'm going to declutter this dresser or this file cabinet. And the truth is those are probably a multi-step project that is going to take a decent amount of time depending on how full it is. So when we break things into really small pieces, it becomes a lot more doable. Ask yourself about what the next small step is and take that specific action only. Continue moving forward one step at a time. This method works best if you are feeling overwhelmed with a specific area in your space or a specific type of clutter. The last method I'll address here is questioning techniques. And this is one of the more generic methods that really can work for any type of clutter. With each of your items, ask yourself, number one, if it brings joy, or number two, if it adds value to your life. Hopefully, all your items will at least satisfy one of those categories. If items do bring joy or add value or both, keep them. And if they do not bring you joy and they do not add value or at least one of those, let go of them. This method works great for any type of clutter. To conclude this lesson here, you want to check out your homework and the printable resource for this particular lesson. I hope that as you are going through these different strategies today, you have a few that you want to start with. Of course, a great idea is that if you struggle a little bit at first, you can always try different methods for different types of clutter. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video.